Hello everyone, my name is Christian. Welcome back to TechPoint. Today our guest is Liam, the co-founder and chief innovation officer at Time Doctor. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, pleasure to have you on the podcast. Please tell us, what is Time Doctor? Time Doctor is a workforce analytics tool for remote workers. So we measure not just the amount of time that people spend, but we measure the websites and applications that they use in order to be able to develop insights on how productive they are, what they're doing with their time, and hopefully how to become more productive long term. What's the biggest problem to solve, basically? For us, the biggest one is we can predict a whole bunch of outcomes. So are you trying to become a better call center agent, as an example? Let's say you want to be able to optimize average handle time. We can use machine learning to be able to tell you that specifically. Let's say that you're a computer engineer and you want to be able to figure out how to write better code that has less mistakes. We can data mine that in comparison to the hundreds of thousands of computer engineers that use your software every single day to be able to figure out exactly what you're doing differently from everyone else to be able to hit your goal. Well, okay. And uh, what do you say are the top three features of the platform most loved by our customers? Oof, uh, well, I probably would say, unfortunately, it's time tracking. So the amount of time that people put in, time tracking is still a critical part of everyone's workday. I think the next one is the website and application analytics. So where do you spend your time in comparison to everyone else? And then the third one would be benchmarking. So how do you benchmark your profession against the industry? And how do you see the differences and the correlations in your workflow in comparison to everyone else's? Okay, that's really interesting. And usually, who's your target company or who who do you sell to? We usually sell to companies that are called BPOs, business process outsourcing companies. So if you've picked up the phone and essentially done any customer service, picked up any customer service line, it's usually run through a business process outsourcing company and they can be front office or back office. We also work with uh, a lot of agencies, we work a lot uh, with a lot of telecom companies, a lot of large corporates, and even very small companies that have like two, three, four employees. Hey there, fellow entrepreneurs and B2B marketers. Before we dive back into the conversation, let me introduce you to a game changer in the lead generation arena, Lead Feeder. Now, we all know the struggle of identifying those elusive website visitors and turning them into valuable leads. But what if I told you there's a tool that not only promises but delivers on supercharging your lead generation and sales efforts? Enter Lead Feeder. Imagine having the power to identify companies visiting your website track their behavior in real time, and seamlessly integrate it with your CRM. Lead Feeder is not just a tool, it's your secret weapon for efficient and targeted lead engagement. Now, how is Lead Feeder different? It's the ability to provide detailed insights into visitor behavior, helping your sales team prioritize efforts and close deals faster. With customizable notification, lead scoring, and GDPR compliance, Lead Feeder is changing the game. Are you ready to revolutionize your approach to leads and deals? Head over to leadfeeder.com for your free demo today. That's L E A D F. E E D E R dot com. Don't miss out on the future of successful lead generation with Lead Feeder. Thank you so much, Lead Feeder, for sponsoring this episode. But now let's get back to it. Okay. Uh, can you share a favorite success stories on how you helped the company achieve, uh, uh, I don't know, a certain number of productivity or uh, revenue? Actually, there's a client that I spoke to literally last week that's off the top of my head. They yep. were trying to identify specifically why one third of their 7,000 employees were taking more than 100 minutes to complete a Zendesk ticket. And they had no idea why this was taking such a long amount of time. So through us doing a whole bunch of data mining and analyzing the hundreds of thousands of tickets that they answer every single week, we were actually able to identify that a lot of these 100 plus minute categories, in which by the way, they lose money on every single one of those that they do, that a... A, a, a rep would go through a ticket, be mid-ticket, and then would go have a coffee break and wouldn't actually take that ticket and toss it back into Zendesk so that another rep could actually work on it. And they didn't really understand it, and they couldn't have seen it any other way without Time Doctor. So now they're doing a completely new coaching program and training program to be able to say, hey, if you're going to walk away from your computer and go have a bathroom break or go have a coffee, take your open tickets, toss them back into Zendesk, because we're literally going to like save millions and millions of dollars just by doing this. <laughs> Amazing and great example. Uh, I love it. How does the pricing work for the platform? 
It's $10 per user per month for the basic program. And then enter, uh, basically our premium plan is $20 per user per month. Anything in any, anywhere in between. So we can also do packaging. So if you just want one particular module, it's going to cost you between 10 and $20. Right. And uh, when should companies uh, think about a solution like yours? Is it uh, after a certain number of uh, employees or industry or how do you define the, the target? So as I said, we have tens of thousands of companies that have one or two employees. We have companies that have 10,000 plus employees. So it's everything and anything in between. Okay. What I would really say is the real value of Time Doctor is if you have a distributed team. So if you want to be able to make sure that you're knowing what everyone is doing located in multiple different countries all over the world and you don't have a physical office to be able to hold them in. And then I would also say if you're looking at large scale HR metrics. So if you know what your retention rate is, as an example, you should probably use Time Doctor. If you want to be able to improve your average handling time or the amount of PQLs that actually get converted to real opportunities inside of your, your sales flow, this is probably a really good tool for you. If you don't know those metrics, the tool is probably not going to be that valuable for you. <laughs> Thank you for explaining. I appreciate it. Uh, how about the integrations? What are the most used uh, that you see? Our biggest integration right now is actually Jira Atlassian, ironically, but we integrate with 86 different uh, project management, task management, uh, HR tools, EORs on the system right now. So pretty much everything that you could possibly think of, we have an integration that sets up for it. Okay, thank you for sharing. How about the market? How competitive is it for you? And how is the Time Doctor different? It got really, it got really exciting post COVID. So pre COVID, no one was really super excited about remote work, or it was exciting, but it wasn't incredibly exciting. And then post COVID, obviously everything blew up. I think probably our entire market was probably worth a couple billion dollars pre COVID, and I would say it is easily ten to twenty x during that time. So everyone in Whoa. the industry has actually seen explosive growth, particularly companies that focused on remote work like us. We were able to really lead the market during that time. Well, wow. and uh, when exactly did you start the company? We started the 20 company in 2012. Okay, well, so th th would you say the boom happened right after the pandemic? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think the six months after the pandemic, I was, I don't know if you've seen those game shows where they have like uh, $20 bills flowing around in like a hurricane tube yes, and people yes. are grabbing the money yes. and trying to stuff it down their bra. That was essentially March, April, May, June, July, August for me. Uh, <laughs> it was absolutely exponential. We, I mean, we're an eight figure SaaS and we grew at 202% for 2020. And if you know the numbers, I mean, that is completely off the charts for SaaS. Yes, I, I know what you mean. Um, would you say there was a particular tactic that uh, brought that growth or is, was it just the market? O of course, it was your preparation. It was a black that, swan but... event. We dominated everything. If you wanted to, we own number one spot for remote work, remote working, all of these keywords that we were really passionate about before COVID, we were just able to basically take advantage of all of that traffic that also not just... We dominated at that point, but literally 20x as well in terms of its search volume. We also run the largest conference on remote work called Running Remote. And okay. that was another really great avenue for us to be able to acquire a lot of customers because then of a whole bunch of people were really interested in remote work. And uh, we had, uh, I think pre-COVID, we had about 700 people that would come to our conference and we were the largest conference on remote work. And then six months after COVID, we had a digital conference in which 8,000 people came. So it was a complete shift. And I mean, as I said before, that was uh, probably the craziest experience of my entire <laughs> life. Um, I had actually one funny story. I had a G20 country that had 547,000 employees on it that deployed on Time Doctor with a credit card without telling sales about it. Because we're a self serve model, and they yeah, crashed, and they crashed our, um, they crashed our uh, our Asian node. So it was it was actually 
terrifying. We thought that we were having a denial of service attack. And no, it was just this massive government that was saying, we went remote yesterday and we have no idea how to actually do it from a security perspective or for a compliance perspective. And we need your help to be able to, to make that happen, which was incredibly exciting for us. Wow. 5,000 employees? No, 547,000 ah, million wow. people. Wow. <laughs> Directly now, not all of those people deployed, by the yeah, way, yeah. we actually, Still. so they tried, they broke the yeah. system <laughs> because, you know, if you really want to figure out how to pressure test a SaaS product, everyone thinks, oh, if we got a million customers tomorrow, you know, we'd be able to do it. No, you can't. <laughs> I could guarantee you because <laughs> you can, you never think to yourself, oh, I can scale to a million users on one single account. No, it doesn't work. And so I think that, um, I mean, it was, is obviously a problem of success versus a problem of failure. But uh, at one point, we were essentially saying trials were even getting shut, shut down because we didn't have the capacity to oh. be able to provide our, we could not process reports fast enough for existing customers. So it was taking like 35 seconds to report for a report to load for existing customers. So we actually shut down trials because we wanted to be able to make sure that our paying customers had a good experience. Wow. <laughs> These are good problems. I like it. <laughs> yes, but, exactly. Uh, now you, you still have the free trial or just uh, continue it? Oh, uh, yeah. The movement? Yeah. So it's a 14 day free it's trial. Back. If you want to try it out, you know, you can absolutely sign up and and try it. Uh, we are not at the point in which I'm pulling my hair out trying to make sure that the servers are working <laughs> properly. And we very quickly adapted. So now we have much better capacity. Great to hear. Do you still do the conference in person? Yes. Next one is April 22nd to 24th in Lisbon, Portugal. And we have a bunch of really great speakers from all over the world talking about everything and anything connected to remote work. That's awesome. I think Lisbon is one of the best places for remote work, right? This this is why you, you chose it. Yes, yeah. absolutely. How about uh, the funding? I know you're a bootstrap business. Tell us about your experience with that. Why did you decide to bootstrap? What's, what's the story with that? So about three years into Time Doctor, we actually thought about raising money and we went to maybe about 30 or 40 VCs and we got some term sheets. We got about half a dozen term sheets. And every single one said that we had to move our entire team to Toronto, Montreal, New York, Palo Alto, San Francisco. It goes on, it goes on. And our mission is empowering the world's transition towards remote work. That's what we talk about when we talk about Time Doctor and, and all the other products that actually connect to, to what we're doing. So we yes. talked to those VCs and we said, don't you think that's kind of hypocritical for us to be able to move all of our team to one particular location when they're remote? And they said, we love your remote work angle. It's great. But listen, trust us. We're venture capitalists. We know what we're doing. You have to move all your team to one particular location. We said, fuck right off. We're not going to do it. And we proceeded with going bootstrapped. And I am so incredibly happy that I did not take any funding because they probably would have pressured us to sell many years ago. And if I had sold before COVID, I probably would have walked away from a 10, 15 X multiple on, you know, on our general valuation. And so I'm so happy that uh, we made the decision that we made. And the other thing that's really great being a bootstrap business is you get to make your own rules. Me and my co-founder who's the CEO of the company, Rob Rawson, you know, we just basically look at each other for our, um, for our year end, you know, executive meeting, board meeting, and we say, so are you happy? Yeah, I'm happy. Are you happy? Uh, I'm happy. All right. Uh, how much EBITDA should be released to each other? That's an awesome way to be able to run a business. And Absolutely. a lot of VCs actually make that process essentially impossible. So if you want to be able to run the long game, I would say do it bootstrapped. All right. So what would be your best piece of advice for a starting bootstrapped founder? be very scrappy. So be prepared to do every job that you uh, think is below you. And boy, someone's never really asked me that question about a bootstrapped founder. I would say be comfortable being uncomfortable. So whatever, you know, you're not very good at, or you're not very good at sales, go do a hundred phone calls. 
If you're not very good at marketing, go write 100 blog posts. Do the thing that you are not very good at and just get all of that out of you so that you can become um, not necessarily a master at everything, but at least understand things to a basic level so that when the company eventually scales, you have a pretty good understanding of how paid advertising work, works or how SEO works or how engineering works or you know how sales works. And you can manage that so much more effectively. Whereas if you're venture backed, a lot of those things just get delegated and you just hire someone to be able to do those things, but you truly don't understand the position, which I think is a major fault of most venture backed founders. I totally agree. Very well, very well said. How big is the team right now at Time Doctor? We are about 170 people, if I remember correctly. Um, it varies, obviously, but I think our target this year is to probably get up to about 200 people. And did you hire massively after the pandemic? Yes. And that was another thing that was a, a huge shift for us is I think we were probably at about 60 or 70 people pre-pandemic. Uh, I would also very much protect people or I would advise people against not hiring too quickly. So what I would essentially do is let's say your headcount is 100 people only expand by 25% of that headcount every single year. So your existing headcount should only expand by 25%. Reason being is if you expand faster than that, you miss the culture of the organization. So you have to do a lot of long-term cultural work later on to be able to, to hopefully clean all of that stuff out. And I also think that you're probably going to make a lot of mishires and there's going to be a lot of people that were hired in the organization that are essentially redundant. And if you're a bootstrap company, you really can't afford that. So do hiring much more carefully than if you're venture backed. Absolutely. What, what is the culture at your company? How would you describe it? I think we're big on, uh, so we have one of our values, which is missionaries, not mercenaries. So we're really focused on the mission, vision, values of the organization. As I said, our mission is to empower the world's transition towards remote work. And mm -hmm. pretty much everybody that works at the company could probably get more money working somewhere else. But they work at Time Doctor because we're really passionate about that particular subject and we're laser focused on it. When my co-founder said, you know, if Google all of a sudden said, hey, we'll buy your company for a dollar and make your software completely free for every single person on planet Earth, we would have to say yes to that, to commit to the culture. Google, if you're listening, um, I'm available, <laughs> call me. I would love to be able to have full capacity so that we can actually get this software to every single person on planet Earth. But that's, I think that's kind of the core of it. And I think actually that's probably the core of every successful culture in an organization is are you doing the work not because you want to get paid, but because you're really passionate about the subject. Great mindset. I, I love it. What would you say was your biggest uh, challenge since starting the company? Hiring More people. than 10 years. Yeah, yeah I, I would say it, it's definitely just people. It's understanding what their motivations are, understanding what they're passionate about, trying to align that towards the goals of the organization. and. Along the way, uh, a friend of mine has this really great saying, and I like to use it all the time. You need to watch out for fuck burps. And uh, so fuck burps <laughs> are basically people, I don't know, if you know an iceberg, only 10% of it is above the water, 90% yes. of it is below the water. So mm -hmm. what you need to do is if you hear people saying, you know, I don't know about Christian. Or, and if you hear that from multiple people, just like little whispers, you might have a fuckberg and you need to get those people outside of your organization. Because when I think about kind of the Venn diagram of, of HR, you have people that have really good technical fit and really good culture fit. Those are the people that you want to keep, give them as much resources as you possibly can. You've got people that have got bad culture fit and bad technical fit fire those people. You've got people that have really good culture fit, but bad technical fit. You need to move them to a different department or retrain them. And then there's the fourth category, which is the most difficult. The people that have a bad culture fit and an yep. amazing technical fit. Your top sales rep is generally a little toxic, a little bit of an asshole. 
You know that that's true, right? The top yes. sales rep is generally a bit of an asshole. And you need to really make sure, do you want to have those fuckbergs inside of your organization or do you want to be able to get them out? And I've discovered if you actually get them out, even though it's scary to hire, to fire like, let's say your best salesperson or one yep. of your best engineers, it actually lifts the entire team by 10, 20, 30%. So you more than make up for that loss with removing fuckbergs from your organization. It's scary when you think about it, but I got to tell you, I've done it multiple, multiple times. Get rid of fuckbergs in your organization and you will grow <laughs> way faster than you are before. Great advice. Great advice. Very well said. Yeah, I, I love those uh, four categories and how you explained it. What's the, what was the idea behind the company? How did you start with this uh, problem? So I was running an online tutoring business back in 2008 which is mm -hmm. very old school. We were running on Skype. I was working about half the time. Some people were even um, using like 56 kilobit modems. It was, it, was, uh, it was very, very, very old school. And one of the problems that I had is I couldn't actually equate for the amount of time a tutor worked with a student. Exactly. So I would bill a student for 10 hours and then the student would say, hey, I only worked with Christian for five hours, not for 10 hours. And then I would call you a tutor and I would say, Hey, Christian, what's up? You billed me for 10 hours. This guy said you worked for me for five. And he said, no, of course I worked with him for 10. So I'd end up having to pay Christian the full 10 hours and refund the student five hours. And that was destroying the business. So time doctor allowed me to very clearly have a third party source of truth to properly wow. equate for those hours. Well, wow. and how did you get your first customers? Were they the existing no. so i would say at the very beginning and and i would say this is true for any business that you start pick up the phone call 200 people and if you can't call 200 people about your problem then you either don't have the balls or you don't have the friend network or you <laughs> don't or you haven't actually figured out the itch to scratch that you haven't connected close enough with those types of people to be able to make it work so i called a lot of people and then I would probably say the next thing that I did, and it's, it's very old school, but this was back in 2012, we wrote a lot of content. We wrote thousands and thousands and thousands of blog posts, and we got better and better and better at content and SEO. And um, that did relatively well. And then obviously with COVID, it hockey sticked because of that Black Swan event. Now, I don't want to say that that's going to happen to you because it probably isn't if you're listening to this right now. But regardless... Yes. Writing content today, if you are a bootstrapped company, is still probably the best long-term ROI. If you plan on owning a business for more than 10 years, all of your capital or the majority of your capital should be invested in content and building long-term traffic for the future. Paying for traffic, as an example, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, TikTok ads, you're only renting that traffic. And once you actually shut it down, you're shut down. So with content it's a slow roll but it really does have a snowball effect and today was the most successful go-to-market strategy for acquiring new customers so it's still definitely content but then i would also probably say brand in general has been a really successful tool for us so we had the mindset of building running remote from the get-go of saying it's a broad tent some of our competitors come to our conference as an example and we allow everyone to be able to have access to that type of information because we really are passionate about that subject and then we have a whole bunch of really great new people that come in that are really interested in this super cool thing and then long term we sell them on the remote technology stack so that's one big source and then another one that's growing heavily now which we should have invested in earlier on is partnerships mm -hmm. So partnerships are really, really big, particularly if you have a good collection of customers. We have hundreds of thousands of customers with our product. And so for us, we can use that to say, well, what about a payroll product? Let's partner with a payroll provider to be able to make that happen. What about a project management system provider? And you just build these partnerships and you exchange customers and it yeah. just makes you so much more powerful. I would say if you have, let's say, more than 5 million ARR, you should be partnering with 
not the $100 million company because they won't pay attention to you, but partner with like the 10 to $15 million ARR companies because it's worth their time to be able to do a partnership and they'll get an extra 2 million ARR and you might get an extra million and you can just keep doing that all day long. I love this. <laughs> I love your tactics. It's so pragmatic. I love it. How about the vision for the future? What do you say is next? So I probably would say... With regards to Time Doctor, ironically, time is going to be the least important part of Time Doctor. As we're seeing with OpenAI and large language models popping up, I think this entire industry is actually going to shift from a what are you doing with your time to how could you actually make the time that you're spending more efficient. And so right. that's our vision. That's what we want to be able to do. We have this terminology that we're using, which is predictive workforce analytics, to really be able to change the way that people think about time tracking or measuring time. It's not so much about time. It's about what you do with that time, which is really important. I, I, I love that direction. I have two last questions for you. Uh, first of all, I'd love to know your story, basically how you started your uh, career after high school or college. I mean, that's maybe a little bit of a long one, but uh, <laughs> I, so I went into grad school and my goal mm -hmm. was to become a lecturer, professor. Mm -hmm. And I went to McGill University in Montreal, Canada. And probably a lot of you don't know this, but if you're a first or second year university student, all of your classes are taught by graduate students. So I was a TA and a research assistant for about six years. And then I actually got my very first class, which was incredibly exciting. I remember showing up that first day. There were about 300 students that were in this first year sociology class. And by the end of the semester, I had less than 150 of them. And I also had the worst academic reviews in the history of the department. And the department had been running for 186 years. <laughs> so it was very, very bad. And I remember going into my supervisor's office yep. and I said, I don't think I'm very good at this. And he said, no, you are not. And I said, so what do you think I should do with my time? And he said, well, you got to get pretty good at this teaching thing. So figure out how to do that or figure out how to do something else. Six weeks later, I threw a master's thesis under his door and I was out into the real world. And I actually sold a business. Here's the crazy part about kind of like coming out of the closet as an entrepreneur. I had sold a business to pay for my grad school to be able to go to grad school because my mother really wanted to have a doctor in the family. So if you have those people that are in your family right now that are really sabotaging you from achieving your true goals because of perception, I mean, even if it's your mother, uh, respectfully tell her to go fuck herself and just get the work that you want to do done and pursue your own passion. And I think that there's lots of entrepreneurs. I'm blown away at how many entrepreneurs that could have been world-class entrepreneurs that are accountants right now, that are lawyers right now, that are just like, they didn't pursue that thing and they're now a crappy worker because they have that DNA and they didn't necessarily pursue it. And I'm so incredibly thankful that I failed horrifically <laughs> at grad school because I wouldn't be where I am right now. Amazing story. I totally resonated with this. I quit college at 21 years old to focus on tech. When I felt something, I felt that I'd regret this all my life if I couldn't uh, follow the, the dream. So yeah, thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. One last question for you. What's your favorite software that you use apart from Time Doctor? I just have to choose one. You can do top three. Mm, so I love it. I love uh, Google Apps for Business. I'm going to cheat on that one because that's an entire suite of products. <laughs> and I kind of love using that every single day. Yes. Um, Fellow is another really great tool that I use on a regular basis. And what that does is it allows you to be able to actually have a agenda for every single meeting that you're going to step into. And I have this saying that I got from the, the founder of uh, Fellow, which is no agenda, no attenda. So if there's no agenda, I don't attend the meeting. And it really focuses my life and allows me to be able to focus on the work that's really important because then we can actually discuss deeper issues and we can ad discuss it before we actually jump into the meeting, which is super powerful. And then I would probably say the third most important 
piece, the third most important app, piece of software. I'm going to cheat again. It's my phone. <laughs> call people. Like it's, it's such an undervalued piece of technology. If I yes. can call someone and saying, hey, would you like to buy this thing? I really think it's a good idea for that if you if you buy this. That is so incredibly powerful. And it costs you, what, $15 a month for a subscription yep. to a cell phone plan? Like, you guys can get on it. You could do it tomorrow. You could call 100 people tomorrow, completely flame out on 99 of them, get one deal, and you'd be ahead of where you are today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is there anything else that you want to share today on the podcast? No, just other than um, really happy to be here. <laughs> and I apologize that I maybe got on a, a little bit of a soapbox there. But for me, I, I'm very mm. passionate about entrepreneurship. So it's something that is near and dear to my heart. I love your energy. Thank you so much for joining the podcast, Liam. You did fantastic and I'm grateful. Thank you. Thanks for having me.